The Apostle Paul went into some of the finest prisons in the whole of the Roman Empire. He was imprisoned on many occasions. In fact, it seems almost like a prerequisite to be a good apostle. You had to also be a long-term prisoner. The Apostle Paul suffered greatly as a prisoner. On one occasion, he said, I have been near to death many times. Three times I have been lashed by the Romans almost to death. Five times I have suffered the 39 lashes from the Jews. I've been stoned with rocks almost to the point of death. I've been shipwrecked afloat on the wild seas for more than 24 hours at a stretch. I've been in dangers in my travels. I've been in dangers in the cities, in the wilds, among false friends, among false Jews. I've spent my life in danger. Dangers in the city, dangers on the high seas, dangers from false friends, from other believers. He said, I've gone without food, without clothing, without sleep or rest. That's what it cost to be an apostle. In this episode, we're going to consider Paul as a prisoner. Now, he was in many of the great and famous prisons of the Roman world. In fact, on some occasions, he was in the same prison on more than one occasion. He was imprisoned in Jerusalem several times, in Philippi, in Ephesus, at Caesarea, and of course, some very long imprisonments at Rome itself. How did Paul cope? as a prisoner. I mean, the situations were deplorable and the circumstances terrible. Did he develop some sense of philosophy of coping in difficulties? He did. And he made several points. And the first one of Paul's, what you might call, philosophy of coping in under difficulties was the fact that he believed that God could supply our every need. He used that phrase on several occasions. My God is able to supply your every need. No matter what your deficiency is, God is able to supply your needs. When in prison, he wrote the letter to the Corinthian church. He made an interesting point to those people at Corinth. He said, not many of you are wealthy. Not many of you are noble or of high birth. And not many of you have means to care for you. But... God is able to supply your every need. No matter what deficiency you face in life, God is able to supply your every need. That's the first point that Paul as a prisoner mentions, which is really helpful to us today, that no matter what our circumstances are, he is able to supply our every need. Paul's imprisonments meant that he could not personally visit the churches he had established, and so he did the next best thing. He wrote them letters. These letters, as we've already said, make up the bulk of our New Testament. In this sense, we can be thankful for the times of imprisonment faced by Paul, because it was only enforced imprisonment that caused him to write instead of visiting, to dictate his thoughts instead of lecturing and speaking. Imprisonment wasn't used as a punishment as such in Paul's day. Prisoners were accused persons awaiting judgment. Punishment in the first century was either by crucifixion for the worst offenders or by beheading, impaling and stoning for capital offences. Other punishments were being condemned to the mines for life or by scourging with a whip or by exile, like the sentence given to the Apostle John. When Paul came back to Jerusalem, he was well aware of the sentence that awaited him. 
Paul knew he was walking into trouble, but still he came to Jerusalem, walking up this same old road that exists here today. And yet he knew that God was able to sustain him, and God was able to enable him to stand firm no matter what troubles that he might face. Paul was coming into the greatest test that he would ever face in his life. He'd already been threatened with death. He'd been warned from Caesarea not to come to Jerusalem, but still he was willing to come. He was facing the death threats, which were very real while he was here in Jerusalem. As you know, he got caught up in a riot near the temple. There was an outburst of public rage against him. He was arrested. He was taken up and placed in prison in Fort Antonius. And then he was brought for trial before the Sanhedrin. It was the same Sanhedrin of which he was earlier a member himself. That night, he was given a message of encouragement. He was told by God, take courage. Do not be afraid. You'll be a witness to me here in Jerusalem and also in Rome. The atmosphere became more oppressive and dark. And Paul himself realized that the end must surely be coming near. Then he had a message late at night that there was a plot to kill him that four men had taken a vow that they would not eat or drink anything at all until they had murdered him. They were joined with another group of men who took the same vow. They were determined to wipe that man out. And so it was that Paul that night when the plot was discovered was taken out secretly and guarded by a group of Roman soldiers was taken to Caesarea to keep him safe. Caesarea was built on the coast of Palestine on the Mediterranean Sea to give the Romans access to the Middle East. They built an artificial harbour by taking huge blocks of stone, some 50 foot in length, 10 feet square, and dropping them into 180 feet of water to build a huge harbour. And there, this centre became the centre for administration, for Roman justice, and also when the winds blew a cool relief from the heat of the inner desert sands. Paul was brought here to Caesarea following the riot in Jerusalem. He was brought here originally for safekeeping, but he was imprisoned here in the Roman garrison for the next two years of his life. The governor here at Caesarea at the time was Felix. He was a lusty, power-hungry man. R the Roman historian Tacitus says that he exercised the powers of a king with the mind of a slave. He played with Paul for two years, hoping that Paul would give him a bribe to be released. But when Paul wouldn't give him the bribe, he just kept him in prison. At the end of the two years, it wasn't that Paul was released, Rather, it was that he was recalled to Rome to start the rest of his otherwise undistinguishable career. Governor Felix was succeeded by Governor Festus. 
Now, Festus was probably a more open-minded man than Felix was. Certainly, he gave Paul a better deal. He tried him and found him innocent. But still, he kept him in prison because he was trying to win favor from the Jews. He did offer Paul a retrial back in Jerusalem if Paul wanted it, but Paul knew that that would be just a kangaroo court. He would get no justice there. So Paul uttered the famous phrase that was available to every Roman citizen, I appeal to Caesar. Nero was the Caesar at the time, and Paul could go to Rome for trial. Looking at him, Festus said simply, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. It so happened that King Agrippa and his wife Bernice were visiting Festus at the time here at Caesarea. And so Paul was paraded before them. Now Agrippa had no authority to release Paul, but he was able to interpret some of the Jewish traditions and understanding. Every time Paul spoke to Felix, to Festus, before Agrippa, he presented his gospel clearly, a witness. This was the proclamation of a prisoner. While he was in prison, Paul wrote letters to a number of churches, some of which we now have. It was his friend who was here, Dr. Luke, who wrote the gospel that bears his name, Luke's gospel, while Paul was also here in prison. And it was while he was in prison that Christians from Jerusalem and from other areas around Caesarea came here and visited Paul, and in those two years, he encouraged them and strengthened them and helped the church grow. Paul once wrote in the letter to the church at Corinth that we live under many trials and difficulties, but God always strengthens us in our trials and difficulties. And the thing that encourages me from his imprisonment here at Caesarea was just this, that there's nothing that comes upon us that is too great for the inner strength that God gives us. He never allows us to be tested beyond our strength to endure. Paul had a right as a Roman citizen for a trial before the highest tribunal in the empire in Rome. He appealed to Caesar and that was where his trial would be heard. However, Governor Festus had certain responsibilities as well. He had to file a proper charge sheet. He had to send copies of the evidence that had already been given. And probably he included King Herod Agrippa's comments about the Jewish traditions and backgrounds. But Paul wanted to go to Rome not just to be found innocent. Paul had an unwritten agenda. He wanted to go to Rome, as he said on two occasions, to strengthen the Christians there, to help build up the church in the faith, and then to go by Rome through to Spain. Because more than anything else, he wanted to preach the gospel on the rim of the empire. This is the Via Appia, the old Appian Way. It leads from the ancient port city of Appia Forum to Rome, a distance of nearly 40 kilometers. Because this was the main road in and out of Rome, it was lined with the tombs of important people. Paul's voyage to Rome from Caesarea wasn't a quick one. As we've already seen in the previous episode, he was shipwrecked on Malta and spent three months on the island, waiting for calm seas. So Paul walked the 40 kilometers up the Via Appia. After he had traveled about 35 kilometers, he came to the Forum of the Appia, 
and there he met at a place called the Three Taverns, a group of Christians who had walked out of Rome to meet with him. How did the church come to be established in Rome in the first place? There is nothing in the writings of Paul or of Luke or the rest of the New Testament that indicates how the early church began in Rome, except for the fact that there were some Christians from Rome on the day of Pentecost. They went back to Rome and presumably established the church here. Later on, both Paul and Peter were to strengthen the believers in the heart of Rome. The first Romans that Paul had anything to do with were Priscilla and Aquila who were evicted from Rome in the year 47 AD under the Emperor Claudius. Paul wanted very much to come to Rome. It was the center of the empire, and he wished to be able to take the message from Rome right through to Spain. He came here to Rome under the leadership of the Emperor Nero. Nero came from a very famous and great family. His mother was the wife of the Emperor Claudius, and she wanted her son to become emperor, so she murdered her husband, the Emperor Claudius. When Nero became emperor, in a fit of temper one day, he in turn murdered his mother. This was the man to whom Paul had decided to appeal for justice when he said, I appeal to Caesar. Paul could have been depressed when he came here to Rome there have been many times in his life when he felt really down. In fact, while he was here in prison in Rome, he wrote that he was cold, he was without friends, he didn't have a coat, he needed some books. But the Lord stood by him and strengthened him. Once he had written to the Corinthians that when he came into Macedonia, he was very depressed, that he was alone and under a great deal of tension and pressure. But the Lord was with him and strengthened him. And throughout his trials, Paul knew what it was to have the strength of the Lord present with him. Paul apparently was released after the first trial. He was alone during that trial, and he wrote that no one stood with him and strengthened him. But upon his release, he had about two years in which he was under a sort of a loose house arrest. However, he traveled to Crete and possibly to Macedonia, and then came the disastrous fire of Nero. He was rearrested, imprisoned, and sentenced to death. The Colosseum wasn't built when Paul arrived here in Rome. It was started in 70 AD and put into regular use 10 years later. It seated 50,000 people and was the site of the greatest gladiatorial battles ever seen. There were battles between professional fighters and between slaves. The Romans had the capacity to flood the central area and hold mock naval battles which were fought to the bitter end. They would also construct a forest, complete with trees and wild animals, and then watch as men would hunt them. It was here that the first Christians were martyred, when Nero outlawed Christianity after he blamed them for the destruction of Rome. When Paul was brought to Rome, he was imprisoned under a personal guard. For the next two years, Paul stayed under house arrest, living in his own house at his own expense, but chained to a soldier. Now the soldier was changed every eight hours, so Paul had at least one person as a captive audience. Some of these soldiers eventually became Christians and are referred to as the saints in Caesar's household. While he was in this house, Jews came to visit him and asked him to explain more about his understanding of the Messiah. There were many people in Rome who were Christians. Priscilla and Aquila lived in Rome, and Phoebe led part of the church here. It is probable that Paul was released after two years following a successful first hearing. 
there is some evidence that in 62 AD the Emperor Nero, in an act of clemency, released numerous prisoners who had not been brought to trial because of lack of prosecution witnesses. It is believed that during this first imprisonment, Paul wrote the letters to the Colossians, the Philippians and to Philemon. It is also probable that what became the basis for the letter to the Ephesians was also written during this imprisonment. Paul probably had two years of freedom, in which Rome was used as a base for his ministry. There was plenty of opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel here. There were one million people in the city, half of them slaves, all of them living within a 20-kilometer area. It was expensive to live in the heart of the city, but a gift brought by Epaphroditus from Philippi helped Paul pay his way. Paul probably stayed in one of the large tenement buildings. Some of them were so large they were called islands. Shops and offices filled the ground floor, and people lived for at least seven stories above. It was common to have to climb 200 stairs to get to the top story apartment. Like today, Rome was crowded with people. People from all over the empire came to see Rome. Tradition has it that Paul visited Spain from here, a country that had been one of his prime objectives for many years. While Paul lived in freedom in Rome, he helped strengthen the church. But Rome was soon to become a living hell for the early Christians, as Nero sought to blame them for the fire of 64 AD. There's probably no more place on earth that symbolizes the trouble of the early Christians and right here on the floor of the Colosseum. Here they were martyred, they were mocked. Their blood was shed for the sport of crowds of people that mocked them and jeered them. And many of them, I'm sure, really wondered, were they worthy to be called the sons of God? Paul wrote to the Corinthians a very important passage about it. He encouraged people to realize that there was nothing that could happen in this life. There was no disgrace that could be brought upon them by other people or what they did themselves that would really disqualify them as the sons of God. In fact, he said to them, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That neither shall thieves, nor drunkards, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor perverts, nor thieves, nor robbers, nor anyone else like this will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you have been washed, you have been cleansed, you have been sanctified, made holy. He said they had been made one with the saints. There was no trouble that could ever come upon them that would make them unworthy as children of God. And in this place, that gave encouragement to the believers in times of trouble. The second problem the Apostle Paul faced was that when people were dragged in here to die for sport before the crowds, it was only natural that they should fear death. And Paul addressed himself to this concern that people had out of fear of death. Frequently he wrote to encourage them that even in times of death, God was able to save them. When he died being beheaded here in Rome just before the Colosseum was built, he wrote to young Timothy saying, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have run the race, and henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which no man can take from me. Probably his most encouraging letter was to the Christians, however, here in Rome, where he wrote to them about what death really means. He said, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall death or life or angels, or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. No, he said, I am persuaded that there is nothing in all of creation that is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul, in a very beautiful way, made it clear. In time of death, God is able to save.
The life of Paul the Apostle, the greatest missionary who has ever lived, started in Tarsus and was about to end 68 years later here in Rome. Paul's life had gone through a dramatic turnaround and it was now about to come to a grand finale. In 64 AD, Paul was taken out of the city of Rome and beheaded. On the traditional spot where this was done, there now stands the church, St. Paul's, outside the walls. This is the last episode of our series, Discovering Paul. Over the past 11 episodes, we've seen Paul as a prisoner, as a philosopher, a preacher and a prophet. We've seen him as a pastor caring for the churches, as a patriot who cared about his Jewish background. We've looked at Paul as a proud Pharisee and a persecutor who tried to stamp out the Christian message. Paul as a protagonist, a pioneer and a proclaimer. The life of Paul as we know it from the New Testament covered a span of some 16 years. In those 16 years, Paul changed the history of the world. From the moment of his conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul knew he would come here in chains to Rome some 30 years later. He accepted his imprisonment because Paul knew that this would serve to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. In our last episode, we looked at Paul as a prisoner in Rome, the traditional site of which is the Mamantinum prison. It was here that tradition says Peter was also in prison. Now we finish discovering Paul by looking at him as a person. 
And so the Apostle Paul came to Rome, not as he had planned, but in chains. He was tried on two occasions. After the first trial, he was apparently released, and then there was a second trial. But then in 64 AD occurred the great fire of Rome. The Senate needed some scapegoats. Nero had fiddled while Rome had burnt, and so they called out for blood. And of course, Nero found blood in the very first Christians. It was under his persecution that both the apostles, Peter and Paul, were executed. Just before his final trial, he wrote to young Timothy and said, the time of my departure is at hand. I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which no man can take from me. And then he said very simply, the grace of the Lord be with you. And so the most noble Christian life of all was coming to an end. No man made a greater impact for the Christian faith than the Apostle Paul. The time of my departure is at hand, he said. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. These are the ruins of the Forum, the center of the Roman Empire. It was the Roman Empire that enabled Paul to be so effective in his ministry. As a citizen of the empire, Paul was able to travel freely from Jerusalem, through Asia Minor, into Macedonia, and down into Greece and beyond. Looking back over the life of Paul, we can see that Paul lived a complete life. Despite suffering from a debilitating ailment and a not very handsome appearance, Paul made the most of every opportunity he had and never allowed personal weakness to hamper him. As we've followed his footsteps in this series, we've seen the rugged terrain over which he had to travel, the many rough ocean voyages he made, and the thousands of kilometers he had to walk. Paul had enormous physical reserves, matched only by a resolute will and great personal strength of character, all of which were finely tuned to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The key to Paul's experience was that he, in his own words, was in Christ. Paul's Jewish heritage, his Roman citizenship, and his knowledge of Greek culture gave him the training he needed to be an effective minister of the gospel. Although back here in Jerusalem, just after Christ's death, Paul was more concerned about persecuting the young church. The Sanhedrin was the supreme civil and legal court under the first century Jewish system. There was no higher body in the land and Paul, as a very young man, was elected to this. This was a very significant appointment. He was elected because of his zealousness. He was wanting to make sure that all liberal elements within the world of the Jewish faith were being stamped out at that time. He was therefore a persecutor of the Hellenists and determined to stamp out all heretics. And it was under this approach of stamping out heretics that he decided that he would persecute the people that were known as the followers of the way. That was the terminology that was used of Christians in those days. And despite the worst of the persecutions that came, God decided to intervene. And in the worst of those times, God came in a very special way, in a way that Paul was not expecting, on a road to Damascus. And there it was that he made his will known to him. So a large convoy of armed troops set out, and at the front of them was Saul, armed with the authority of the chief priests and the elders to arrest any that they found of the way of Jesus and to bring them bound back to prison in Jerusalem. They went along the hot, stony desert way, 
north of Palestine to Damascus in Syria. It was there on the desert road toward Damascus that there was to occur what in all of recorded history is one of the most dramatic accounts of human conversion ever known. Saul needed to be helped up from the ground, for his eyes had been blinded by the light. Quietly and humbly, he was led into Damascus, where for three days he was unable to eat or drink. Saul's life was absolutely shattered, but out of that, a new man was to emerge. This was the start of a new life for Saul, or Paul, as he now became known. After Paul's conversion, everything was different. Paul was now in Christ. Instead of persecuting people of the way, he became a proclaimer, a preacher, and a pastor of those early Christians. Paul embarked upon some of the most remarkable journeys ever undertaken by man. These days, it's relatively easy to get to places like Ephesus in modern Turkey. But the Apostle Paul walked thousands of kilometers over some of the roughest terrain imaginable. He endured hardships and disabilities. Why? Because he was in Christ. Paul centered much of his ministry here in Ephesus. This Roman city was the center of Roman administration for all of Asia Minor. Paul established the church here, and while here, he preached in a number of places. He would always go to the synagogue and tell the Jews about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. He held meetings in private homes, the first house churches. He preached in the open air, but he had great success by using a public hall. Renting a public hall from Tyrannus or someone else like that certainly had several advantages. It meant that Paul could be in one place at one time, people would know that he would be there, and they would come on a regular basis. Paul was very successful. We read that he argued and he debated and he discussed and large crowds of people came. So much so that the sale in the little silver statuettes of Artemis declined and that caused trouble. Now, what was Paul arguing and discussing about? He'd spoken firstly about the righteousness of God. Now he speaks about the true nature of man, what some people have called the depravity of man. In essence, this simply means that man is utterly powerless to do what he wants to do. The fact is that all of us fall short of being what we ought to be. And something in our nature means that we cannot be what we know we ought to be. This inability of mankind to do something to make a difference to himself, to make him become what he wants to be and what he ought to be as opposed to what he is, was demonstrated very clearly in the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In the first and second chapters of Romans, he illustrates man's inability to overcome his environment and his heredity. Chuck Colson, who was with President Nixon in the White House, recalls how while he was in prison, President Nixon resigned. Looking at the whole scene from prison, Chuck told me very simply this. I suddenly realized that even presidents could be gripped by the weakness of their own humanity. Even presidents. You see, there's nothing about it that we can do by ourselves and for ourselves. Faith is essential for our salvation. This is Athens. 
Athens, in Paul's day, the most famous city in the world for philosophy and culture. Paul came here on his second missionary journey, coming down from Berea and Macedonia. As Paul looked round at the architecture and heard the philosophers talking in the marketplace or agora, he knew that what he had experienced through the person of Jesus Christ was far more real and relevant than the strange and obscure arguments the Athenian philosophers discussed. Because he had a new idea to present, he was invited to address the city council on Mars Hill. The sun was setting on the Greek Empire when the Apostle Paul came here to Athens. But when he came to Athens, into the home of Socrates and Plato, Xenophon, Aristotle, he came to the most brilliant philosophic minds of the era and spoke about the Christian faith. Here was a Jew who was a Roman citizen coming into the midst of the Greek Empire arguing about philosophy. What an achievement! But there was even a greater achievement behind it when we consider his life. First of all, Paul was the best educated of all the early Christians, and therefore there was an intellectual capacity he gave to the Christian faith. He traveled to more cities than any other believer in the early church, and left behind a string of churches right across the known empire. He was the foremost evangelist that the church had, and structured a missionary strategy that penetrated the known world. And of course, he was a great theologian. He took the statements of the Christian faith, of the incarnation, of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and gave them meaning and substance. And every theologian ever since has had to deal with the theology of the Apostle Paul. Paul was the man who took the Christian faith from a Jewish sect on the fringe of the empire and turned it into a worldwide religion. He was the one who trained leaders, preachers, teachers, who established the churches right across the known world. And he wrote letters, perhaps scores of letters of which we have at least a dozen, from prisons in Ephesus and Caesarea and Rome. And he sent them to the most influential churches of the early world. Those letters in turn were to become the most influential epistles ever to be known in the history of mankind. What an achiever, that Apostle Paul. But apart from the mission of Paul to the Gentiles, Paul also had a mission to the Jews, to his own people. And it was here in the temple and also in synagogues around the world that Paul taught the history and philosophy, the prophecy and the scriptures of the Jewish people. Probably no one traveled as extensively as Paul to preach among the network of synagogues around the world how Jesus Christ was really the Messiah. Today, the Jewish people are still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. All things then will be complete when the Messiah comes. Frequently, the Jewish people today speak about when the Messiah comes. But Paul made it very clear that when the time was ready, he said, God sent forth his son born of a woman. The Messiah has already come. God was in Jesus Christ reconciling the world to himself. This city of Jerusalem will see the Messiah come again, but his second coming will be with glory and power.
Paul echoed the prophet Isaiah when he talked about Christ returning to establish his kingdom here on earth. More than anything else, Paul wanted his fellow Jews to be like him, a fulfilled Jew, a complete person in Christ. But the authorities imprisoned Paul after his third missionary journey, and he was taken to Rome as a prisoner. Downtown Rome is noisy and bustling, and here at the Colosseum, it's a great place for tourists. But it wasn't a great place for tourists, nor a popular place in the first century. It was here that thousands of Christians were martyred. The Apostle Paul, after three years of imprisonment, and then release, and then imprisonment again, was taken outside the city walls and beheaded. There's something ironic in the fact that, like his master. He was despised and rejected of men and taken outside the city walls and executed. But as God had been with him on the Damascus Road in prisons and riots and shipwreck, so God was with him even in the time of death. His death was not that of a failure. In fact, his death liberated his life and his teachings and the gospel spread throughout the world. Nero had found his scapegoats, but he also discovered a great truth, that you couldn't stop the gospel message, because what had happened was that the blood of the martyrs had become the seed of the church. And in that spirit of truth and freedom, the gospel spread throughout the known world. The influence of Paul's life didn't end when his did, back in 64 AD. Down through the centuries, Paul's writings have influenced many people. Almost every great movement in the history of the church has been brought about by a rediscovery of the significance of the New Testament, and in particular, the letters of Paul. In the 15th century, a Roman monk, Martin Luther, ascended these stairs in the Santa Scala Church in Rome on his knees. The stairs are said to be from the house of Pilate in Jerusalem and are the stairs that Christ climbed when Pilate tried him. Climbing these stairs on your knees was a way of earning God's favor, or so Luther was told. It was only when Luther read Paul's letter to the Romans that he understood that the only way to receive God's forgiveness was through faith in Jesus Christ. Luther's grasping of Paul's words was to start the Reformation. In May 1738, John Wesley wrote that as he read Luther's introduction to Paul's Book of the Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed. I felt an assurance, Wesley said, that Christ had indeed taken away my sins and cleansed me from the law of sin and death. How can we adequately assess the contemporary significance of Paul? His theology is basic to all that is Christian. His life has inspired generations. Whenever Paul has been rediscovered and his writings read afresh, there has been a new outbreak of evangelism and witness to the faith in Christ. The early church gave their verdict on the life of Paul by collecting his letters and writings and recognizing them as being inspired by God. Paul is the outstanding ambassador for Christ, pointing always to his master and Lord.